So I will get started and, and thanks everyone for joining us um, for this Kirby seminar, which is a little bit out of session for our usual Tuesday session series. Um, my name is Tanya Applegate and I'm from the Kirby Institute. And I would like, I'm very lucky to be able to chair this um, session this afternoon, which is really an opportunity for those who were unable to join the, our first Australasian point of care um, conference for infectious disease that was held earlier this year. For those people who are unable to join, just to hear a little bit more around the, the key learnings and messages of what that conference brought and what it was and where we hope to go with into the future with that conference. So, but firstly, before we start, I, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm meeting from today, and that is the, the Bidjigal people of, of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the different lands that are from which you're meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And would also like to, particularly with National Sorry Day tomorrow, um, recognise their continuing connection to, to culture, land, see the waters and the community. And it's an important opportunity for us to all reflect on the fact that these, all of these lands always were and always will be Aboriginal lands. So for this conference, so this meeting, as I said, it's really like a, I could call it a fireside chat or a wrap up of the conference, um, but we're gonna hear from four speakers. But before I introduce those four speakers, I'd just like to give a very brief introduction as to how this conference came about. And it really was sort of a, a baby, a birth, an idea of, of what is a Centre for Research Excellence led by Rebecca Guy. And that CRE is called RAPID. And that uh, RAPID is, is a point of care research consortium which aims to bring together people that are interested in infectious disease um, point of care testing research and to try and share their knowledge and also enhance the evidence base across different disciplines such as health economics, social science, modelling, epidemiology, to try and increase our capacity to scale up um, point of care testing in the region on, with a focus on infectious diseases. And together we felt that particularly off the back of COVID or as we emerge, continue to emerge from the pandemic, the timing was right and the need was right and actually the demand was there for us to to be able to try and share that knowledge as a, a collective, to try and figure out where we are in the point of care testing space for infectious disease and where we need to head to, to, to make sure that this can reach um, everyone across communities to increase equi equitable access to healthcare. So hence the birth of POC 23, which was held earlier this year. Um, and the opportunity there was to try and bring people across settings, across, um, obviously countries, but different infectious diseases, different expertise and skills to try and sort of jump out of their silos and to share their knowledge and learn from each other. So that's what this meeting was about. And today we're lucky to enough to have four presenters share their perspectives on what the conference sort of meant to them. So we've got Dr. Louise Causa, who'll be speaking first. Um, Lou is a medical epidemiologist and a senior lecturer at the Kirby with a extensive experience across infectious diseases, but particularly in SDIs and point of care testing in remote communities in Australia. Um, and Lou will be sharing her perspectives on the clinical and public health messages of the conference. And then we have Inika Gao, who we're lucky enough to join us as a research manager at the Kobe Institute um, as a molecular scientist and is very much involved in helping the, the First Nations molecular point of care testing program. And Inika will be sharing her um, thoughts on sort of innovations, the scientific innovations that were shared at the conference. And then we also have Rob Monaghan, who is the, the lead and the manager of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research Program here at the Kirby Institute. And together with Emily, so Emily is also a, a project manager, very much involved with um, expanding the learnings from infectious disease point of care testing in remote communities and leading a, an incredible collaboration across many, many organisations to try and accelerate that, um, that area of research. So together, Emily and Rob will be speaking particularly about their perspectives on a Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community session within the conference and to share what they felt were the key learnings from there and, um, and what we where we might go to from here. So I'm actually going to, I will stop there. It was quite a long introduction, but I felt important context to provide. 
So I'll hand over to Lou and, and we'll have Q and A's come through in the chat. So please add them there. And then we'll have time for questions. So you can raise anything you like at the end as well to, to ask the uh, presenters themselves directly. So thanks very much, Lou, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tanya. And um, thanks for the opportunity to share my perspectives. Um, can you see my slides okay there? Great. Um, so perhaps just to start off with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm presenting, the Camaragal people, and extend um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are um, participating today in this meeting. So I'm focusing a little bit on the public health and clinical kind of aspects, but I just thought I might do a little quick overview of the conference itself. So. Tanya mentioned this was the inaugural conference. It was held over two days in Sydney in mid-March. And um, pleasingly, we had uh, 290 registered participants, uh, the majority sort of indicating they were from research, clinical or community, uh, with a good representation from industry as well. Um, the registered participants um, came from across 20 countries. And the conference itself also enabled a number of side meetings to be held, bringing everybody together who'd been a little bit disparate over the past few years because of COVID and sort of just getting back to travel. So in addition to achieving some terrific main aims for the conference, there was also this lovely opportunity for collaboration um, as a result of the conference. So we were really um, delighted to be able to um, have um, some stellar keynote speakers as part of the conference. Um, locally, we, we had um, uh, speakers, uh, Lorraine Anderson from the Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Service, Angela Kelly Hanku from the Kirby, uh, Duncan McInnes from MTP Connect, and Susan Matthews from the Flinders University International Centre for Point of Care Testing. And then internationally, we had leaders in the field of point of care testing, including Rosanna Peeling, Yuko Manabe, Nataya Panupak, um, Lady Roslyn Morata, uh, Mart Marta Fernandez Suarez, and Trevor Peter. So, just an incredible um, wealth of knowledge there um, over the two days shared um, as keynote speakers and, and sort of participants in the conference. We were pleased to be able to see presentations across a range of point of care testing technologies, um, molecular based testing antigen and or antibody testing and platforms that were single and multiplex. So single plex being one disease detected at a time, one pathogen detected at a time, multiplex where you might have two or more pathogens detected using one sample and one test. Um, we saw a range of infectious diseases. I think these are most of them, but there might've been a couple of others. STIs and BBVs featured quite heavily, uh, but we also had um, point of care test experience um, from respiratory infections, including COVID, influenza and RSV. Uh, we had HPV um, represented and also some new um, sort of non-infection non specific tests um, that I'm sure Inika um, will speak to. Uh, there were 114 abstracts that were submitted to the conference and the selected abstracts represented experiences from uh, a broad range of countries across Asia Pacific um, and also a couple of sub-Saharan Africa, African nations um, um, just a little further afield. There were a variety of delivery models presented. Um, we heard about point of care testing targeted for screening, such as Dr. Lindy Masson's presentation on a new low-cost point of care screening test that might be used among asymptomatic people. Um, to identify whether or not they might benefit from a subsequent um, STI diagnostic test. Uh, many of the presentations uh, on point of care testing were focused on definitive diagnosis uh, to enable more um, rapid treatment, um, such as chlamydia, gono, um, trichomoniasis, and or HCV. There was clear acknowledgement across the presentations that point of care testing was being used to address barriers to accessing traditional laboratory-based diagnosis. Um, work was presented on experiences with a variety of specimen collection and testing approaches that included self-collect and self-testing, peer-assisted and peer-collected and clinician-collected and testing. 
We heard about novel collection um, processes such as the dried blood spot, uh, which was coupled with laboratory-based testing to reduce barriers to accessing HIV and HCV testing. We heard about the uptake of home-based specimen collection and self-testing for HIV using commercially available kits in Australia, and also the acceptability of a pilot program in Bhutan involving peer outreach workers to engage MSM and female sex workers in HIV self-testing using oral fluids. There were several presentations which highlighted the value of point of care testing in simplifying the patient care pathway, including uh, reducing required follow-up visits and removing extra diagnostic tests and steps and engaging patients more readily in care or providing more timely treatment. Uh, Dr. Nataya Panyapat described an exciting approach being used in Thailand, using point of care testing to optimize community led and integrated health services for key populations, whereby the patient pathway was demedicalized and an HIV neutral care approach offered, enhancing patient experience and reducing stigma. We heard about innovative approaches, including mobile and web-based strategies to facilitate access to HIV testing. We even heard about a vending machine distribution project uh, for HCV uh, self-testing in Brisbane. Um, Hub spoke and centralized models for screening and integrated testing for HPV um, using existing molecular testing resources was described from five sub-Saharan African countries and suggested that near point of care testing could be feasible in these resource limited settings for HPV. We had experiences shared from Papua New Guinea, Australia, and also from Indonesia, where integrated models are being implemented. That is whereby um, a client might visit it in one visit, uh, include testing for multiple infections, either using the same platform with different assays or using multiplex assays uh, for multiple diseases. And while some barriers were acknowledged in terms of broader implementation, such as um, needing to break down silo program delivery and also to support um, workforce adequately, um, these models showed some promise and may result in further utilisation of already resource, um, resourced equipment and more comprehensive benefits to patients. In addition to local and regional programs, um, we heard from Australian colleagues regarding national scaling up of, of molecular point of care testing for STIs, uh, respiratory infections, uh, including COVID and HCV. Uh, point of care testing was delivered across a range of different settings, including primary care in remote and regional Australia as part of national respiratory and STI programs, in sexual health services, in antenatal clinics with um, terrific examples from Papua New Guinea and from Indonesia, in justice and custodial settings, um, in particular through HCV RNA point of care test testing, and in a range of variety, uh, range of community settings. Evaluations were being implemented through a variety of approaches that included pilots and demonstrations, trials, and fully fledged programs. Um, a session that was held, uh, one of the lunch times highlighted the importance of harnessing multidisciplinary research to inform scale up. And we saw throughout the conferences with researchers reporting findings that related to acceptability and experience of end users, feasibility, uptake and reach of point of care testing programs, their clinical effectiveness as measured through cases detected, time to results and treatment, linkage to care. And we certainly had public health impact explored through um, modelling and uh, real world scenarios uh, to determine morbidity and mortality prevented and transmissions and infections averted. Um, there was work on health systems and processes and certainly um, um, the costs and cost effectiveness of these programs in different settings addressed. So the main outcomes that I um, just wanted to, I guess, highlight was that all the presentations tended to come to the same conclusions. Um, point of care tests implemented in the right way are highly acceptable to end users. They do save time, they can be cost effective, and they certainly improve clinical outcomes for individuals. 
Uh, what was quite striking is that I guess these point of care testing programs can lead to very large public health benefits as well. And I think this was um, highlighted particularly well um, regarding the programmatic public health impact demonstrated by um, the presentation of, by Lorraine Anderson and Belinda Hengel, uh, who described the First Nations Respiratory Infections Program, um, which was estimated to have reached 25% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population um, and, and averted between 100,000 and 120,000 infections as a result of rapid access to um, SARS-CoV-2 um, testing. We heard about experiences and successes relating to the critical supporting infrastructure that enable point of care testing to scale up. Uh, among the presentations, um, colleagues from NRL, Flinders University International Centre for Point of Care Testing and the Kirby Institute described quality management and training programs that support the successful STI programs and HCV and respiratory programs being scaled up in Australia and also the establishment of novel connectivity infrastructure to support the implementation of these programs. The keynote speakers um, highlighted the complementary role that point of care testing can make um, with traditional quality providers and also that the collection of, and sharing of data is critical to the ongoing um, sustainability of point of care testing. We had a number of our keynote speakers, uh, including Peter Trevor, Sue Matthews, and Duncan um, McInnes, um, highlight um, conditions that are required for the scale up and sustainable point of care testing. These included things like manufacturer commitment, market and country readiness, a receptive regulatory and policy environment, suitable governance structures, unanimous agreement with stakeholders, and really sustainable funding pathways came up again and again, um, with particular note that current models are not well suited to um, adopt such technology and to um, adequately cover service delivery, including and particularly including workforce. Um, and waste management strategy was also highlighted in one of the lunchtime sessions, particularly as a key element to the implementation of these programs. Um, well, there was there was also recognition um, of significant progress made off the back of the COVID pandemic in terms of development and innovation and consumer literacy and, and acceptability of point of care tests um, to such a point also that there's almost a demand now being created um, for, by consumers that they should have access to point of care testing. Um, there was consensus that point of care test implementation and scale up requires leadership and advocacy, um, significant collaboration and time and continuous engagement with community and all stakeholders. Uh, and there was um, recognition that there are mutual benefits to everybody through the use of point of care testing, uh, but not to forget um, data sharing as this is on, often an undervalued component of um, point of care testing. Um, I have taken this slide directly from Rosanna Peeling's uh, talk as I sort of felt it clearly captured uh, the important potential of point of care testing and the key sort of value adds uh, to keep us all enthused as we also have to ponder the many barriers and challenges to this sustainable and scalable um, technology. Um, and I won't read it all out in just the interest of time, but. Um, her perspective was uh, much appreciated, I think, from, from the audience, um, and she's got a very, a very um, deep knowledge and understanding of all those components that we talked about on multiple occasions through the, through the conference. And maybe just to final, fi finish off my presentation was this um, slide from uh, Yuka Manabe, um, that life is not about waiting for the storm to pass, but learning to dance in the rain. So I thought that that adequately captured my feelings, at least at the end of the conference. Lots of challenges to the, to the ongoing sort of scale up and making sure that um, everybody can, who needs to benefit from point of care can. But if we wait for everything to be perfect, we'll be waiting for a long time. So I felt enthused to continue, which was a great place to be at the end of the conference. Um, so that's my perspective in a nutshell. Um, and I'm really pleased to hand over to um, Inika Gao, who's going to talk about the scientific innovations um, that she observed uh, at the conference. Thank you very much, Lou, and thanks for your great summary. Um, 
I will just share my screen, but I would uh, like to um, begin by um, showing my respects and acknowledging the traditional custodians on, of the land in which we meet today, which for me here in Wollongong is the, um, the Wadi Wadi people of Darawal country. Um, and I'd like to um, extend that to elders past and present. So uh, in looking back at the um, Point of Care 23 conference, I was truly impressed at the vast amount of work that was being generated in the development and execution of Point of Care diagnostic assays and the systems that support them. While taking stock of the scientific and technological aspects of the presentations, it was evident to me that many speakers and groups took a patient-centered or people-centered approach to their assay or system development. So the end user benefiting from the test was very much considered, whether that was seen as the point of care operator, the clinician or the patient, and really had their needs inform the design of their tests and studies. Uh, so looking at some themes that could be drawn from scientific in innovations at um, the Point of Care 23 uh, conference. So firstly, it was just the incredible range and diversity of technologies that were presented. So we saw both new technology, but also old technology adapted onto new uh, testing instruments and devices. And these are really revolutionizing the way that we reach areas of healthcare not able to be accessed before. Um, so it was acknowledged that many of these new diagnostic uh, technologies and modalities arose from the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, and prior to that, TB, malaria and HIV pandemics. So we were taken through the four generations of point of care tests by Yuka Manabe, and we saw that test runtimes, affordability and portability have drastically improved as the industry is maturing. So the vast majority of technology was molecular testing, um, including those near point of care platform, platforms at the lab and the clinic um, and the true point of care platforms that are able to be used out in the field. So um, much less present, but still there were the lateral flow testing, um, such as the device used in the GIF study um, by Lindy Masson at the Burnett Institute. Um, and as said before, this is yeah, a, a low cost accessible uh, screening tool to identify women with genital inflammation. And this has consequences in, um, sorry, excuse me, uh, in um, both reproductive complications and HIV acquisition risks. Um, and this is really interesting looking at um, that indication of uh, inflammation rather than detecting the pathogen itself, which is quite novel. So next, the term integrated point of care testing came up frequently, and this is acknowledging that multi-pathogen multi testing and testing to inf both inform and monitor treatment um, is becoming increasingly important. So monitoring treatment at that initial um, point of uh, patient contact, and then as well as ensuring successful follow-up occurs, and this utility was starting to be embedded into the diagnostic algorithms, exploiting that proximity of the point of care test to the patient. So for the multi-pathogen testing, it was mentioned that this is about understanding that patients want that diagnostic certainty. Um, they'd like to know more than what they don't have. And this included opportunistic testing, looking at detecting and co-circulating pathogens through that multiplexing, um, and this aids and enhances surveillance. So in one of these examples, we saw both the target organism and its associated resistance market, markers being detected in Nicole Erdl's um, from the University of Queensland work. And um, this was a high performing, um, sorry, my slides are going a bit haywire. I'll just turn off my mousey. Um, so um, it was a very high performing um, in terms of lim limits of sense uh, detection, um, amplification based lateral flow tests again, um, that targeted Neisseria gonorrhea and um, resistance markers linked to four antimicrobials often used in uh, with that um, infection. So we really saw diagnostic uh, 
technology and design, di design and implementation purposefully applied to reduce barriers to testing. So firstly, many speakers very much considered turnaround times, incorporating not only time to result, but also time to treatment is crucial, acknowledging that any loss to follow up has the potential to disrupt that continuity of care and those fast results are needed to initiate that public health response. So test developers really strive to reduce the run times of their assays, but also researchers targeting existing tests. We're really looking for those with those fast turnaround times. So innovation in adapting clinical sample types to the test, whether that was to increase that acceptability, reduce stigma, or simply allow individuals to take control of their health through having choice. Um, the collection devices and the transport meters were very much considered. So for example, in whole blood collection, we saw many studies um, employing finger stick or finger click collection to one, increase that acceptability but also to, to um, reduce the need of trained venipuncturists. Or there are collection devices um, requiring lower blood volumes specifically designed for use in ill children and infants. So the tests are being adapted to these. Um, and the geographic barriers, we saw the challenges of um, testing models where point of care testing was not truly portable and therefore not effectively decentralized. So we had examples of where both the samples and the test cartridges containing the test reagents faced difficulties reaching the testing units. So there was innovation in the diagnostic testing models um, were implemented to combat that lack of physical access. So we, show, we saw Shane Tillicaratne's um, study across the University of Medicine in Myanmar and the Kirby where self-collected finger prick samples allowed for um, that flexible collection and transportation system through a hub and spoke modeled model to um, bring those samples across fast distances where they could be used with a um, with an um, already uh, adapt adapted to an already existing um, molecular point of care platform. Um, so, and this is really getting those tests to um, an access to those, to uh, diagnostic services that were not previously available. Uh, we saw that point of care technology is not technology in isolation. The technology is utilized in the context of the healthcare or testing environment that exists. So whether that's point of care testing that are lab based, institution based like jails or schools, clinic based and even creative delivery models such as uh, Josso Loan from Hepatitis Queensland Combi Clinic delivering hepatitis C um, detection and diagnosis to urban uh, Brisbane out of the back of a van. I'm um, using right, moving right down to those tests that can be performed at the home and self testing. So we found many speakers um, embedding innovative thinking all along all parts of the development pathway or study design right from the outset. So considering WHO guidelines, target product profiles um, and other criteria such as Rosanna Peeling's assured and reassured criteria for the ideal diagnostic test. So an example of this was ensuring that an assay could be adapted onto battery powered and equipment free devices. Uh, and right down to the market considerations. So how can we achieve um, point of care test price per test that reflects that of its laboratory counterparts? For the test developer or implementer, these contextual observations help raise high level considerations along that development pipeline, such as can the text compl test complexity be adapted so that the task shifting and demedicalization in the workforce can occur and then right questions right down at the research and development level. So how do we balance the point of care test performance with the throughput um, to increase value? Um, so looking ahead, um, there was we it was acknowledged that point of care has made significant process in recent years, largely coming out of the COVID pandemic. Um, but there are still areas identified where future efforts are required to keep the momentum we've seen going and continue to improve the impact of point of care technologies and ensure their sustainability in a post uh, pandemic environment. So part of this will be uh, continued innovation by introducing novel sample types such as breath aerosol testing and artificial intelligence used to view and interpret lateral, interpret lateral flow tests, or even um, a com to interpret a combination of tests to diagnose lung disease as Yukum and Abe showed us. But going forward, the point of care industry needs to ensure that the technologies developed, the market that demands them, and the healthcare systems that support them both work and evolve together. Thanks. And I'll now hand over to Rob.
Thank you, Annika. Thanks. Thanks. I'll just stop sharing your screen, Annika. Yeah, I'm just, um, oh, here we go. I was just looking for that. Are we? Um... While they're doing that, I'll, um, I'll just acknowledge country. So um, on behalf of Emily and myself, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land. Um, today, I come to you from my grandfather's country, which is Gumbangi country. I'm a uh, Gumbangi Bunjalang boy, live up on this beautiful place, nice and sunny day in Grafton. Um, so, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, that's, um, that's that. and look, um, Em's gonna run you through the agenda. Em and I will probably just bounce around in this um, presentation a little bit. We're pretty relaxed. Um, yes, I guess the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community session was ran a little bit different than the other sessions. It was really intended to be quite interactive between our speakers and our audience. I think as um, Tanya and Lou had spoken to earlier, part of the conference aim was to bring people from together from across sectors. And I think that, that was really important to have all of the right people in the room to start talking about some of the aspects that we think are important for delivery of point of care testing in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, which um, we'll talk about a little bit further, but um, specifically relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership and governance of these programs, which um, Mel Fernando spoke to as part of our agenda um, for this session. Then sort of showcasing some of the um, success of Aboriginal community adult health organisations and the use of point of care testing. Um, so we heard from Daniel Hunt, uh, Dr. Daniel Hunt at Devil Year again about um, the syphilis point of care testing program uh, and how they've been able to, um, I guess, reduce um, their rates of syphilis within their community using that tool. And then our last part of the session was um, a 60 minute panel session. I think both Rob and I were a little bit nervous at the beginning whether we could run a panel session uh, for 60 minutes and keep the conversation going. But I guess what we learned from that was that people are really keen to, to talk and share their experiences. And they especially, um, you know, people coming from health services in rural and remote Australia might not be um, that confident to stand up and present at a big conference like this. But um, if we're able to bring people together um, as part of a, a panel and, and create a safe place, then people are really keen to talk about their experiences, both the success um, and the challenges, but also what they do in their community. So um, it was really useful to have, I guess, that free space to run um, such a long panel session. Back to you, Rob. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. What did we learn? So, you know, lots of discussion, like uh, Emma was saying, there's huge amounts of discussion. Um, and we just picked out some of them that's come out, but one of the bigger things that um, right across, you know, most of the research, and this is what we're trying to instill into research is the importance of um, Aboriginal leadership um, and governance in uh, in our projects. Um, and it's more so in the, uh, the point of care, you know, that was really important that um, that leadership was um, led by Aboriginal people um, and workers. Uh, the governance was overseen by, um, uh, the First Nations group, um, and also governance within within the services that um, the point of care were at. So um, hugely important. Um, and also the unique approach health services take to engage their communities. Um, you know, that innovative approach of actually just getting an Aboriginal person in the door to have the test. Um, lots of services done them in different ways. Like there's not one strict way on how you should do it or how you could do it. But a lot of the services had uh, different ways of enticing people in um, to have the um, the COVID test and look also just reward people in some ways and sometimes. So it's those approaches that health services take um, that uh, why communities want to go and have the test, um, but also engage right across that whole health spectrum um, in their services. Um, and the success of the point of care testing. Um, so it was, you know, right from the walking in from the receptionist right through to the clinical services, how a uh, success uh, that um, the testing was for um, infectious diseases. It, it's um, how it explained from and how the ease of it was, um, obviously the time factor, 
and uh, you know the the touch points. So there's uh, with the point of care, there's only uh, a few touch points where the normal way of pathology testing, um, and then coming back for results, it is was just too many touch points. So really successful across that whole um, program about how successful um, the point of care testing was, and it was really positive to hear. Um, obviously, all programs have you know things they could work on, but um, there was lots of positive things about the, the point of care testing part of it. Can we talk about the workforce? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I think we've, you know, we obviously heard a lot about the success of clinic care testing, but we know that it doesn't come without its challenges as well. And I think that, you know, what we heard throughout um, the conference and throughout this um, community session is that workforce is still um, one of our biggest challenges. I think that, you know, everyone that was uh, in our session was really keen um, for point of care testing and probably would like to use it more, but we know that workforce continues to be a restraint. And so I think it was, you know, really important for us to hear as, as researchers as, and, and as people who are delivering these programs to really start to understand um, those limitations and, and how we can adjust our programs and, and start working with health services and community members around how we can start, you know, finding different approaches, whether it's different models of workforce, whether it's training different people. Um, you know, whether it's just having some of those sit, sit down conversations and talking about um, the implementation of programs. Um, but I think that, you know, probably the biggest thing that we've taken away is that as we continue to introduce more tests, and that's really exciting for both the health service and, and for us as people who are delivering these programs, we do have to be mindful um, of the additional workforce that, these, uh, that this puts on uh, services as well. And probably the last thing and, and probably really the biggest thing I took away from the whole conference and this session was the importance of, um, you know, just being connected. I think as, as Lou mentioned at the beginning of her talk, it had been a couple of years, um, you know, due to COVID that we weren't able to come together, which meant that a lot of those um, experiences just weren't shared. Um, and by bringing this session together, we had people um, on the panel from across jurisdictions and people who are in different stages of their point of care journey. Some people had been using point of care testing for a long time and for lots of infections, um, while others had you know, just started or may have just had their training but hadn't run a test yet. And I think um, to me, it was just really nice to sit within those group of people um, and hear them sort of encourage each other and talk about the challenges and you know, so yeah, we tried that or we experienced that as well. And sort of, you know, I think it can become really overwhelming when you've got this new technology and um, these new processes within your service, but to then hear from other people who are in a similar position to you and um, have had similar experiences, I think, um, that a lot of people walked away thinking like, oh, great, like, you know, I'm so glad that I'm not the only one feeling that way. Um, and then after the conference, we were able to connect people up, both who spoke on the panel, but then also others who were just part of the conference were able to exchange contact details for those people. And we've received feedback since that they've, you know, been in contact and um, have started talking about how they're implementing clinic care testing within their service. So I think that that's really one of the biggest things we can take away from the conference is just the importance of, of bringing people together and, and making the time to have those conversations. Anything else to add from you, Rob? No, I think it's a great, you know, um, great exercise and, um, yeah, bring on the next one um, and have, you know, especially in Australia, more Aboriginal participants in it because, um, you know, they they are part of it and they benefit from it and all those things. And that just that last point, I think, is the most important one where you bring them together, not just about going to a conference. It's about the networking and it's about the support mechanisms they instill and the, um, you know, the positives. Um, there's probably um, lots of gaps in the program where we could fix, but a lot of them spoke about a lot of the positives, you know, in this program, what they're getting out of it. So, yeah, no, I think it's um, a yeah, great experience. Um, and for me personally, it was a great experience just to be part of it. Got wrangled into the last session, but um, just to, you know, see people enjoying and seeing some of the, especially the international speakers and what's going on there as well. So. Lots of lessons we can learn from them as well. 
Yeah, and I think just on that point, I know there's a couple of people um, that I can see who are on uh, this webinar who we also roped into the panel session at the last minute as we had you know, some people who may have been keen to talk and then got a little bit nervous. And so there was a bit of a um, you know, round up at the end to see who um, we could get on the panel. So yeah, just a, a quick thank you to those people who um, yeah. you know, made it possible to, to run the session um, and also to I guess the Kirby team and to Asham for um, supporting scholarships for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to attend this mm -hmm. conference. Um, without those scholarship opportunities, it's often not possible um, for people to come, especially when you're traveling you know, quite long distances. We had people from um, you know, the Northern Territory and from um, the Kimberley in Western Australia um, come to this conference. And um, it is a really important, important thing for people to do. That is all from us. Um, I think we'll move into the Q&A, but we'll hand back to Tanya. Thank you so much uh, to all of our presenters. It, it was an incredible insight and overview, actually, of what was, although it was only two days as a meeting and with a couple of satellite meetings either side, it was um, an intense jam-packed, energy-filled, really positive feeling with a lot of information. So the feedback that I personally received was oh, so excited. I'm so motivated. As you're saying, Rob, there were very positive experiences mixed with, oh, my God, we've got so much to do. But at the same time, here we are. We are dancing in the rain. <laughs> we, we, we are doing it. Um, systems may not be perfect, but it was this conference, I think, a really good example of where it was not too big, it was not too small, but it was across disciplines and expertise and knowledge that allowed people to really sort of cross-fertilise those ideas in a small enough environment to allow those conversations to happen um, and to learn from each other. So that was that was all of you just now um, encompassed that level of detail in the across the spectrum. So thank you. And we do actually have a couple of questions that have popped up and thank you to the audience. So there's over 90 people still here um, for this meeting. So I appreciate um, the opportunity for you to please reach out if you have any questions for the speakers or generally, or even people that attended the conference. Is there something else you want to add? Just pipe up, feel free. Yeah. Um, so we did have a first question actually, which is around, and it was it's related to what was discussed um, at, across the conference, which was, talking to sort of innovative models of care and ways that we can sort of better increase the reach, demedicalize and, and sort of um, task share, task shift um, that point of care testing enables. So it's a specific question around um, to what extent the lay providers and peers were involved in point of care testing, were there examples of that? And what were the challenges um, or resistance in establishing lay providers as part of the care team? So I know Lou, yourself and Emily uh, sort of have experience perhaps in the work, different workforce models that have been discussed. So would either of you like to comment on the role of um, lay providers and sort of some of the, you know, challenges or resistances in setting that up? You want to go, Lou? Or? Uh, yes. When I, I saw, when I first saw that question, actually, I was thinking, Gosh, you know, thinking back to the different presentations, there were such positive experiences presented in terms of having lay or peer assisted, whatever aspect it was of a program. And in fact, it kind of enhanced in every way the delivery of the program. Um, the experience, I guess, from, you know, my sort of current work, which is around, I guess, molecular testing and implementing or supporting implementation in remote and regional health services is very much recognising that existing clinical staff are already full. They have a full load. Um, and in fact, some of the challenges that we've been appreciating is around, I guess, um, there's quite high turnover of existing staff in those communities. Um, Whereas there could be a really terrific opportunity to um, extend, I guess, the responsibility of, for testing to non-clinical staff, which could be considered some, like community members from the community who maybe don't have particular clinical training, but could be um, 
trained, so to speak, in taking on the responsibility of point of care testing at, at a clinic or in some sort of other approach. And in fact, that would also be a better connection to the community um, and could lead to potentially some increased uptake of attendance or point of care testing or a whole range of things, not just a test being done by somebody who's perhaps um, not as well collected to the community. Um, so recognising there is a potentially a really big role for peers or non-clinicians um, to take in some of the programs that I'm involved in. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just my perspective on that kind of question. M. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a really exciting time to explore some of those alternate workforce models. Um, I think we've already seen um, the importance of, you know, like health promotion officers and Aboriginal community like liaison officers in being able to bring people into the clinic, like they might not necessarily be the person performing the test at this stage, mm. and, you know, that may change in the future. But I think that um, it's really engaging people and letting them know that there is point, a point of care test available within the service and they get their results quickly. And, you know, that, that word of mouth of, of bringing people in, I think is a really um, important role in, in point of care testing that our peer workers and, and non-clinical staff are already playing. Mm. Thanks, Emily Lou. And I think it also speaks to the future pathway. So we're in this incredible space now where um, the current regulatory environment, we need to create a, or a develop a, a fit for purpose regulatory environment that involves accreditation and training of people and making sure that the models that work, that clearly work, as you're saying, Emily, there are people that are already reaching out to the community to enable them to be trained in, in, in an environment um, and continue that training to increase the reach acceptability of that point of care testing in, in the community led by peers, conducted by peers. And I uh, globally, there are many examples of this occurring, particularly, for example, in the hep C space. So I think we, we definitely need to generate more and more evidence of, or just not evidence is probably there, but it's actually now implementing that, making sure the regulatory environment recognizes that as a model of care that is necessary to, to make it successful. Um, so if there are no other sort of comments from the panel on that point, there's another question here, which is really important. And Lou, it's definitely directed towards <laughs> you <laughs> with regards to um, the limitations in use of data. And it brings up, this is from John Weaver, and it, it, who's, I might note, is a, a vet epi interested in, in identification of um, zoonosis and food safety. And something that wasn't, we haven't touched on in this wrap up, but is very much was it, important to the role of point of care testing and was mentioned during the conference was about the, the impact that point of care can, testing can have simply on the better management of infectious diseases and reducing the risk of antimicrobial resistance development. So just understanding what infectious disease you have at the time and treating it within 30 minutes, knowing exactly what it is, as opposed to, oh, you've got something, you think you've got something, here's an antibiotic, We'll see if it goes away, we'll send a lab result, you know, send a test off. If it comes back, oh, actually it was something different to what we thought, we better change the antibiotic or just, you know, without that knowledge, that provides an environment where antibiotics are overused or misused and that leads to the increase of or the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So it's a really important point. So thanks, John, for raising that um, point around AMR. But your actual question was, in fact, around the use of data and, and Lou, this is near and dear to your heart. Um, how how do we overcome this sort of this sharing of data is critical, as you said, to enable the the um this this whole um structure and point of care testing to be implemented at scale. How do we overcome such a fragmented data management system, particularly Australia? We've all got a different jurisdictions and regionally as well. Everyone has their own system. How do we overcome that? It's a big question, but I'm throwing it to you. <laughs> Yeah, and look, I, I think, you know, it, it's well recognised the importance of data collection and I guess in this, the sharing of the data and making sure, I guess, part of some of the work that I've been involved in um, has been for the programs in Australia, um, ensuring that data capture and delivery was part of the whole infrastructure. So, you know, things that started off as small pilot programs kind of built into it this idea that, well, 
we're not just collecting the data for our research purposes, but actually there's data for clinical management, there's data for public health surveillance, and how do we kind of build that? And I guess we've got one, you know, a, a good example in Australia of working quite closely with um, pathology providers, with um, surveillance, public health surveillance teams in the jurisdictions, um, clinic uh, staff to understand how their local clinical management systems work to ensure that, for example, uh, for particularly for molecular point of care testing, I guess it's kind of technology that's developed to the point where you've got digital messages that can be harnessed and then moved to different people. Um, so, you know, for, for example, we've got a system that's supporting the STI and the respiratory infections program that's being um, it's now established at you know about 100 regional and remote Aboriginal medical services. And that system actually captures the test result. It delivers it back to the patient management system for that individual, um, as would a pathology provider providing a result. So that result gets back and into the electronic health record as a permanent record. A copy is sent um, to the departments of health for surveillance purposes. So for COVID and respiratory infections, that's all tests, negative and positive. And that was kind of done because in the pandemic, that's what was required. There were emergency directives that we were trying to kind of work within. And then for STIs, we're just getting to the point where we're starting to do delivery of positive chlamydia and positive gono results to different jurisdictions, kind of following off the back of the, the network that we've established for COVID and respiratory infections. Um, but that will sort of, I guess, complement what's happening with lab. It'll continue to support public health surveillance around those notifiable infections. And then we also have, I guess, an ability as a program to track testing and positivity in a de-identified way that might flag or give indicators for perhaps a bump or a potential increase in cases, you know, that sort of early warning, I guess, you know, this is sort of taking it perhaps a bit beyond what we're doing, but, you know, there's the potential there. If you do harness that point of care testing data in a way that's real time and usable and accessible, that you could build that into early warning systems, you know, perhaps um, emerging infections, you know, I mean, on the flip side, if you think the way COVID and respiratory infection point of care, point of care testing kind of came about was we had an STI program and we built off the back of that because there was a, suddenly a COVID assay that was available. Um, so you could sort of imagine this resource, this molecular platform resource we've now got well established, you know, should there be something in the, you know, something new and emerging, um, potentially there, there, there's a network there which you could leverage to then, you know, um, do some additional testing for a new and emerging infection. But I think what we, I think, you know, everybody at the conference is particularly, you know, our international colleagues and Rosanna Peeling has this published in many of her um, papers around the importance of data flow, data collection, and using it for um, monitoring, uh, epidemic monitoring, surveillance monitoring. And then there's a whole AMR sort of side to this as well that, you know, exactly. kind of touched on, but uh, we could talk about. Yeah, so I think that's actually a really nice um, segue because it does link to um, the importance as well. It was part of the original um, comment was in relation to AMR and the opportunity perhaps in the future of enabling um, resistance guided therapy tests at the, at the point of care or enabling that AMR data to reach um, not just the patients, but from a surveillance point of view, so that we understand what strains are circulating and what antibiotics might need to be used in parts of the country versus different parts of the country. So, Anika, that kind of takes me to a question for you, which is in relation to, and then I think this, I think I've got another one in mind, I think we'll be flying straight to Rob. Um, it was in relation to how do you, so you've touched on in your presentation, all these innovations, particularly at the time this conference was presented, we we're coming off the back of this thick and fast and furious innovations that COVID brought. So there's all this technology sitting there in the wings by all these incredible manufacturers. Some of them are game changing technologies in terms of devices that are designed for the point of care, completely revolutionizing the way we used to do things. So how do you see that we um, maintain that momentum or best harness that sort of innovation that COVID brought 
to reality. There's all these great ideas and industry partners, and I know that you also have a, an industry background yourself. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, there are, as you say, there are so many great ideas out there and the platforms that are um, that are coming up and the diversity of them. Um, but to, to harness those, I think it can't just stay within one sector or one industry. So it really needs to be a connection between, um, yeah, the the biotech industry, like you say, these developers, but also um, academia. So we really need those connections to be forged between these institutions or universities and those conversations to be had. Um, but more so also bringing in the community. So the people who really want and will use these tests and, you know, as we've seen in these criteria is like developing these with the community from the start so that we're not getting down that pipeline through the um, development side of things or even the right at the the very start of with the academic um, side of things um, without straying too far from where the needs mm. are so um, yeah and as you say the um, the these developers have that technology but it really has to be linked um, to the the research that is out there, what's happening on the research front line. So that's one aspect to it. And the other aspect I would say is um, is actually getting governments involved to fund innovations to be across it. In Australia, we really need to um, build up this um, bubbling away um, innovative um, work that's going on and also um, have those conversation with the regulatory bodies. So how would this look in practice? And particularly for point of care, it is that kind of... Um, and it's still seen as an emerging kind of field. So, yeah, talking to the regulators and making sure that we can build this up within a safe regulatory framework. Thanks, Inika. So that then it does lead um, to my question, which is for, for Rob, actually, from your perspective. So Inika just mentioned there the importance of sort of that is the public-private partnership and, and we all focused on and are aware of the patient-centred approach, but how is it best, particularly perhaps from the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community's perspective, to make sure that engagement is, is there throughout that process from the very early innovation stage and figuring out what's needed through to the implementation. How, what's, what is your, um, your thoughts on how is that best um, brought in throughout the entire pipeline pathway? Yeah, sure, Tanya, and Emily might want to also mm. comment, but... Um... Look, what we're you know striving for and what we're really turned the corner on at the at the curb is you know this thing called co-design. We need uh, co-designing all of our programs from the ground up and from the really from the first time when you get an idea about a program and you want to engage Aboriginal people, you need to be thinking about co-design. You need to be asking Aboriginal people, you know, what does it take for you to come into a clinic? Um, how what would it entice you to come into a clinic? Because look, what you know, services um, and unfortunately researchers in some ways, um, what we do with Aboriginal people, we do too. We don't do with, and that's where the secret is. We need to be doing it with Aboriginal people right from the get go. Um, I know. Em, what do you What do you think? We're sort of running out of time, but yeah, I mean, we like it was really exciting. We ran our first co design workshop mm -hmm. for infectious disease point of care testing alongside the conference. So that was one of those, I guess, examples of um, bringing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people together to talk about how we should deliver a program before we've even started. And I think that that's you know, something that we um, are committed to moving forward. But also we obviously didn't have time to touch on, um, on this call, but the work that um, Mel Fernando is leading with the First Nations Infectious mm -hmm. Disease Leaders Group um, is really, you know, I guess, the governance for the infectious disease point of care testing programs um, in this space as well. So I think that that's really exciting and, and hopefully we'll be able to share more about that group over the next couple of months as it gets established as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And and Rob, you're right, we have, we're spot on run out of time. <laughs> so I, um, Emma, I know you actually do have one last slide, which is a bit of a, a, a bragging point, actually, just Hopefully the conference, the PSC24 are about to uh, announce where it will be in the next little space in the next short period of time. So please stay tuned and we'll let you know more about where that meeting will be held. Um, it was from all accounts, the feedback that we've got a very successful conference and there's definitely a, 
a demand to have it again um, and to, to expand the knowledge that we're all sharing. So thanks once again to all the speakers for, for sharing their perspectives and particularly at such short notice. Appreciate that time very much. And to everyone who has joined this presentation today um, and hopefully it's been helpful and we'll see you perhaps at the next conference and we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks to, thank you all.